From New York, this is Democracy Now! Battle tanks are, of course, important, uh, both to be able to repel uh, Russian uh, new offensives, but also for Ukraine to be able to retake uh, territory, to, to win and to uh, prevail as a sovereign independent nation in, uh, in Europe. Germany and the United States have agreed to send dozens of tanks to Ukraine, ending weeks of debate between NATO and allies. Russia has decried the decision as a blatant provocation. We'll speak to a member of the German parliament. Then the doomsday clock moves closer to midnight, closer than ever before. Russia's thinly veiled threats to use nuclear weapons remind the world that escalation of the conflict by accident, intention, or miscalculation is a terrible risk. The possibilities that the conflict could spin out of anyone's control remains high. Plus, we'll go to Florida, where racial justice advocates and educators are vowing to fight Florida Governor Ron DeSantis after the state banned an advanced placement African American studies class for high school students, claiming it lacks educational value because it mentions black queer studies, intersectionality, and Black Lives Matter. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Germany's announced it plans to send at least 14 Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine after months of pleas from Kyiv. Germany also said it would soon allow other European countries to send their own Leopard tanks. The U.S. is also expected to announce today it will deliver Abrams tanks to Ukraine, though that process could take months. The heavy tanks could prove to be a major turning point in Ukraine's fight against Russia, which is approaching its one-year mark next month. Moscow's warns such a move would be seen as a direct provocation. We'll have more on this story after the headlines. In other news from Ukraine, the government of President Volodymyr Zelensky has fired a number of top officials as part of a growing corruption scandal, which includes reports that the military paid inflated food prices. Turkey's postponed scheduled talks on Sweden and Finland's bids to join NATO amidst mounting tensions with Sweden after it allowed a far-right politician to burn a Quran during a protest in front of the Turkish embassy in Stockholm. Finland has said it would consider joining NATO without Sweden in the wake of the dispute. The British government's admitted around 200 asylum-seeking children have gone missing since July 2021, prompting outrage and calls to fix Britain's immigration system. This is Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick. Of the unaccompanied asylum-seeking children still missing, 88 per cent are Albanian nationals. The remaining 12 per cent are from Afghanistan, Egypt, India, Vietnam, Pakistan and Turkey. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has previously vowed to enact even harsher policies to block asylum seekers, taking aim at those who arrive on boats through the channel. In New Zealand, Chris Hipkins was sworn in as the nation's new prime minister after Jacinda Ardern announced last week she's stepping down. Hipkins, the architect of New Zealand's pandemic response, will lead the ruling Labour Party into October's election. Carmel Sepuloni was also sworn in as new deputy prime minister, becoming the first official of Pacific Islander heritage to hold the office. Sepuloni is of Samoan, Tongan and European descent. In Lebanon, Reuters reports former Prime Minister Hassan Diab has been charged with homicide, with probable intent for the 2020 Port of Beirut blast, which killed at least 218 people, injured thousands and caused widespread destruction. The public prosecutor and head of the domestic intelligence agency at the time of the disaster were also charged. This comes after Judge Tarek Bittar unexpectedly resumed his investigation into the explosion Monday, after it was stalled for over a year due to political Political obstruction. The probe is likely to face more resistance, as Lebanon's chief prosecutor said Batar had to pause his efforts until judicial authorities give him the go-ahead. Many survivors of the blast, victims' families and legal advocates, have supported Batar's investigation and continue to seek accountability for the tragedy. 
In Eswatini, human rights advocates are condemning the assassination of the prominent opposition politician and human rights lawyer Thulani Maseko. Unknown attackers shot him dead out inside his home Saturday. Maseko was a longtime critic of King Mswati III, who renamed the nation from Swaziland to Eswatini in 2018. In 2021, mass protests demanding the abolition of the monarchy erupted. The king's security forces killed and tortured dozens of people. Maseko provided legal support to detain protesters. The UN's human rights chief is demanding Eswatini authorities conduct an independent investigation into Maseko's murder. In Cameroon, well-known journalist Martina Zogo was found dead near the capital Yaoundé Sunday, five days after he was kidnapped. Zogo was the director of the radio station Amplitude FM, frequently reporting on corruption. Reporters Without Borders said he recently discussed a case of embezzlement involving a media outlet with government connections. Press freedom groups are calling for an impartial investigation and accountability for Zogo's murder. In Florida, racial justice advocates and educators have vowed to fight the blocking of a proposed new advanced placement course on African American studies. Republican Governor Ron DeSantis Monday said he supports Florida's education department after it claimed the class violates state law and pushes a political agenda by teaching high school students about the Black Lives Matter movement, black queer studies, slavery, and reparations, and other topics centering black historical figures and events. Meanwhile, teachers in Manatee County, Florida, have taken to covering up or removing books from their class libraries after a new law prohibiting classroom material that hasn't been vetted and approved by so-called certified media specialists went into effect. Teachers found a violation of these guidelines face felony charges. We'll have more on this story later in the broadcast. A lawyer for Mike Pence said a small number of classified documents were found at the former vice president's Indiana home and were handed over to the FBI. The lawyer says Pence requested a review of materials at his house following news of classified documents being uncovered at President Biden's residence and former office. It's unclear whether a special prosecutor or a special counsel will be uh, appointed to investigate the Pence classified documents. The Justice Department in eight states have filed an antitrust lawsuit against Google for using its monopoly power to quash competition in the digital advertising industry. This is Attorney General Merrick Garland. Google controls the technology used by nearly every major website publisher to offer advertising space for sale. Second, Google controls the leading tool used by advertisers to buy that advertising space. And third, Google controls the largest ad exchange that matches publishers and advertisers together each time that ad space is sold. As a result of this scheme, website creators earn less and advertisers pay more. Meanwhile, senators on the Judiciary Committee grilled the president and CFO of Live Nation Tuesday, accusing the company of anti-competitive practices since their merger with Ticketmaster in 2010. The hearing was spurred by the Taylor Swift ticketing fiasco in November, when the Ticketmaster site crashed during pre-sales, which the company blamed on the onslaught of bots that purchased tickets to resell at higher cost. This is Senator Amy Klobuchar at Tuesday's hearing. Today, Live Nation doesn't just dominate the ticketing. It's about 70 percent of the big concert market. But also, they own many of the major venues. And for the venues that they don't own, they tend to lock in on three, five, seven-year agreements, which means that the competitors that are out there aren't able to even compete when it comes to the ticketing. Finally, they dominate the um, promoting. This is all a definition of monopoly, because Live Nation is so powerful that it doesn't even need to exert pressure. It doesn't need to threaten, because people just fall in line. The FDA proposed new legal limits on the amount of lead permitted in baby food for babies and toddlers. The agency estimates the new levels could reduce dietary exposure to lead by about 25 percent. Researchers say even low exposure can lead to learning disabilities and other health impacts. Many critics said that the limits are not good enough. 
Walmart is raising its minimum wage from $12 to $14 an hour. Labor advocates have long called for a minimum wage of at least $15. Walmart CEO Doug McMillan earned $25.7 million in 2022. And the journalist, author and former publisher of The Nation, Victor Navasky, has died at the age of 90. Victor Navasky became editor of The Nation in 1978, was its publisher emeritus until his death this week in New York. In 1980, his book Naming Names was published, chronicling Hollywood's era of blacklisting. Navasky spoke in 2009 at an event at Google. The nation was founded by people in and around the abolitionist movement, and the abolitionist movement turned out to be ahead of its time. The nation has been, as Katrina said, a fighter for equal rights, human rights, civil rights, civil liberties. During the years of the bleakest years of a segregationist country, the nation was ahead of its time. Victor Navasky, who died Monday at the age of 90. He's survived by his wife, three children, and five grandchildren. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and uh, around the world. Germany's officially announced it'll send 14 German-made Leopard 2 battle tanks to Ukraine and allow other NATO allies to send more German tanks to help Kyiv in its fight against Russia. Germany made the announcement after the United States reportedly agreed to also send 30 M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine. In a statement, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said, quote, This decision follows our well-known line of supporting Ukraine to the best of our ability. We're acting in a closely coordinated manner internationally, he said. Germany will also provide training and ammunition for the tanks. Scholz had faced intense pressure in recent weeks from Poland, the United States and other European nations to approve the tanks, despite concern by many in Germany that it could lead to an escalation of the war in Ukraine and retaliation by Russia. The head of the left party in Germany's parliament warned the move, quote, potentially takes us closer to a third world war than in the direction of peace in Europe. Supporters of the decision include NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who has repeatedly urged NATO members to speed up deliveries of heavy weapons to Ukraine. The only way to lasting peace is to make it clear to Putin that he will not win on the battlefield. Therefore, we must provide heavier and more advanced systems. <coughs> So, so that Ukrainian forces are able to repel the Russian forces, not only to survive, but to win, take back territory, and prevail as a sovereign independent state in Europe. We're joined now by a member of Germany's parliament, Sevim Daglen, a member of the opposition left party, elected to the German parliament in 2005 and a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. She's also a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. She's joining us from Havana, Cuba, where she's visiting as part of a delegation organized by the Progressive International. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. For people in the United States, they might particularly not understand what this controversy is about for some people. Can you talk about um, what the decision means today, the announcement, to send these leopard tanks to Ukraine, but also allow other countries like Poland, who have these tanks and in Scandinavia, uh, to be able to send them to Poland as well, getting them originally from Germany? Well, hello, Amy, and thanks for having me. Uh, the, this decision, uh, sending battle tanks to Ukraine from Germany and um, giving the decision uh, that Poland and others can uh, send Leopard 2 German tanks to Ukraine, is a historic wrong decision. And it comes only because of the pressure, the heavy pressure of the United States Biden administration, we have to say. Several months ago, Chancellor Scholz, in the German parliament, in the Foreign Affairs Committee, 
said it is a red line. It's a line of escalation sending battle tanks from Germany to Ukraine that would cross a red line. But the pressure now was too heavy, too strong from the Biden administration to send Germany in the front line of this war. And it was the pressure of the coalition partners, the Greens and the Liberals. They are actually the neocons in this coalition in Germany. They uh, officially said that they would breach the coalition if these battle tanks, Leopard 2, wouldn't be sent by Chancellor Scholz to Ukraine. And that was the problem. And we are now in a in a very bad situation because I think it's a wrong decision, historic wrong decision, because it's against the majority of the population in Germany. According to new polls in the last, in the recent days, the majority in Germany is against sending battle tanks to Ukraine. The majority is in favor for more diplomacy for a negotiated peace in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the other thing is the 31st of January will be the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of the battle in Stalingrad. And every family in Russia lost loved ones in this battle in Stalingrad. And you do not have to be a prophet to know that sending German tanks against Russia in this proxy war of the United States will have a way more mobilization in the Russian society in this war. So that means uh, you have the opposite impact, what you want actually within Russia uh, towards this war. And this is uh, why it is historically so wrong to send battle tanks. Uh, Stephen, Doug Dillon, I wanted to ask you, here in the United States, the the, the the mass media are even more war uh, warlike than the government, constantly pressing the Biden administration to provide more aid and uh, increasingly lethal uh, aid uh, to Ukraine. I'm wondering, what is the situation in Germany in terms of the media's impact on your government leaders? How are they portraying or, uh, or depicting uh, the need for more armaments for Ukraine? Well, you know, we have a really extremely warmongering atmosphere in Germany caused by the media, the mainstream media as well. And it was interesting. I was in March or in April last year in the United States, in Washington, D.C., and uh, representatives of the State Department, of the Pentagon, and the National Security Council, they are all said that uh, the German media made such a great work in Germany to uh, push the uh, German new government for the Zeitenwende for 100 uh, billion euro for militarization and sending weapons and arms uh, to uh, Ukraine. That, and I think, you know, it's, uh, it must be something wrong if, uh, if, uh, if representatives of a third state, like in the United States, are saying the German press is working well. The problem is uh, the German mainstream press is so much involved and cooperated within the Atlantic Council, transatlantic uh, think tanks, and so on. So many editors, mainly the main editors or chief editors, are uh, cooperated in this transatlantic uh, think tanks, and that's the problem. We have, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the the policy of interests of the United States, and and I believe it's not not even the interests of the population, of the people in the United States. It's, a, it's the interest of an elite of uh, neocons in the United States who are having, obviously, obviously having the, the, the position that uh, Europe is uh, like Latin America for the United States in the 70s, and a, a continent where you can do uh, what you favor is uh, what you please and uh, and that's a, really a problem and obviously it is a good business to have a war in Europe for the US fracking industry and for the military industrial complex in the United States and this is also uh, a concrete example with sending tanks to Ukraine sending tanks to uh, from Germany and the German tanks the Leopard 2 is also in the interest of the United States military industrial complex because there this is, uh, if they get lost, their Leopard 2 tanks, the modern, the most modern weapon system 
in Europe we do have in tanks uh, system, uh, then they can supply their own tanks. Uh, because you see, um, the other thing is, uh, Scholz failed, Amy Goodman just uh, announced it, Scholz failed in his demand uh, towards the United States to send also tanks, battle tanks, to Ukraine because according to the Washington Post, it can take several years, up to several years, to send uh, the U.S. tanks. So they're pushing us, uh, the Germans, into this fire, into the front line of this fire, uh, especially uh, regarding their own interests, uh, supplying their own military uh, um, industrial products, and uh, to have the situation that German, uh, Germany and Russia for good have no relations at all. I mean, that was in the past uh, when you see uh, the, the books of Brzezinski and so on, uh, of uh, many uh, think tankers in the United States, it was always um, uh, an aim uh, by the United States elites uh, to destroy the relationship between Germany and Russia. And this is my concern because yesterday, uh, last night, uh, uh, already the Green Foreign Minister in Germany, Annalena Baerbock, started to say officially, we are fighting a war against Russia, she says. That means we are in a war already against Russia and that concerns me a lot and it concerns me a lot also that many uh, so-called progressive in the United States are supporting uh, this line by the Biden administration to push Germany uh, more and more into this uh, proxy war and um, yeah, taking, taking uh, the risk uh, that it can have an extension to the Third World War. And the problem and is you, you having a third world war in a continent like Europe will not affect you in the United States 8,000 kilometers away from Europe. It will affect our people in Europe. Uh, you mentioned also uh, the fracking industry and this proxy war. Uh, could, for most Americans are not aware of the enormous uh, profits that are being made by U.S. natural gas companies as a result of this war and the impact it's having on the, uh, the uh, energy needs of Europe. Could you talk about what's happening in Germany in terms of gas prices and, and, uh, and uh, the necessities for heating there? Well, uh, we have the, according to the new, um, uh, uh, new uh, uh, publications by several economic institutes in Germany, we have a, a real loss of wages of about uh, 5%, uh, so it's, it's uh, concrete 4.7%. Uh, uh, it's the biggest loss in real wages, uh, in uh, the biggest loss in the history of the Federal Republic of Germany since 1945. Uh, people cannot afford uh, to pay their rents, to pay the gas prices, the energy prices, the petrol, and uh, they can afford uh, even uh, the, uh, the to, to, to pay uh, for food. Uh, that's the problem. Two million people, uh, the first time in history in Germany last year, they had to go to the public uh, food services uh, to get uh, food. Uh, and in this, uh, in the, one of the most economic powerful countries in the world, so we have a really loss uh, in the majority of the population. And on the other side, we have a huge profit uh, on the side of the companies, uh, more than 100 uh, uh, billion uh, profit they made uh, by the uh, industry of energy and oil companies and uh, all the big uh, uh, companies as well. And the fracking industry from, uh, from the U.S. is a big uh, uh, profiteer of this crisis as well, of the sanctions. You know, it is all caused by the sanctions against Russia, this energy sanctions, and it doesn't harm Russia. The Russian uh, Gazprom uh, firm, the company, made uh, in the uh, first half of uh, 2022 more than 40 billion just profit just profiting and uh, the same at the end of the year so they are profiting from this war the only uh, one who is suffering is the population in Europe uh, because of the sanctions because these sanctions are turning into a economical war against our own 
population and uh, the fracking industry from the United States they are sending now tanks of their uh, of their dirty uh, gas uh, from the United States which is against the climate as well and uh, and the thing is one tank they can get profit um, up to 200 million or uh, 300 million euro there is no limit at all because just on the way from the United States to Europe it, the prices can uh, rise so uh, they are making a lot of uh, a lot of profit because the need for Germany for this gas is approximately that you you would need more than 1100 tanks per year uh, and uh, I can't see uh, that we can uh, afford this uh, to pay uh, to, uh, to the United States in comparison to the cheap and uh, more less dirty uh, gas uh, from Russia. S Seven That's a Vandalin, really huge problem for the German population. I want to ask you about Germany's new defense minister, Boris Pistorius's comments just before we went to air. This is what he said. I believe that this decision is historic because it is being made again in a coordinated manner, because it is being made in a highly explosive situation in Ukraine. And that is why the decision deserves respect. But of course, it also deserves the respect of everyone who is concerned that this war will continue in this way and that we will possibly suffer more from it at some point than we would like today. But one thing is clear. We will not become a party to the war. We will make sure of that. If you can respond to what the new defense minister said, right, um, the previous uh, defense minister, uh, um, Lambrecht, uh, she was Dumpy. ultimately forced to resign. Um, and if you can talk about this controversy and also respond to the division of progressives from the United States to Germany, those that say do not feed the military-industrial complex, and those that say if Ukraine doesn't get these heavy weapons, Russia will succeed in taking more land? Well, uh, I really have to warn all these uh, illusionists, all these people who are fantasizing about a victory against Russia. They are underestimating Russia like Napoleon and Hitler did in the past. And it's a, you know, it's a nuclear, the most powerful nuclear power in the world. And it, there is no way to win uh, a war, a conventional war against such a nuclear power. And, uh, and this, is the, this is the dangerous part of uh, this discussion, uh, that on the one hand side, they all are saying that uh, President Putin from Russia is insane and he's crazy and he's a monster and whatever. And they trying to demonize him like they did in the past with uh, Saddam Hussein uh, or Gaddafi or anyone else uh, they wanted uh, to uh, put down. And uh, the thing is, they say he's crazy. But on the other side, they say, well, it's a bluff. We don't think that uh, Putin is so irrational to use nuclear weapons. I mean, come on, we cannot. Uh, seriously debate of using nuclear weapons because if they will be used once it's the end of the human civilization uh, at least in Europe maybe not in the United States but in Europe uh, definitely and uh, that makes me really worry about it this this, uh, this uh, debate and the other thing is the former minister Ministry of Defense in Germany uh, Christine Lamprecht she was so much under pressure from the neocons in Germany, the Greens, the Liberals, and the mass media, they uh, put her a lot of under pressure to resign because they wanted to replace her with a more transatlantic warmonger than she was for uh, for them. She was not enough warmongering, and Pistorius was a surprisingly decision made by Chancellor Scholz. But unfortunately, he is disappointing as well because he's not acting according to the will of the majority of the population in Germany, but says more diplomacy for a negotiated peace uh, rather than sending battle tanks. He is now saying, well, we're sending battle tanks uh, in, in, in cooperation with our allies. And I have to say, very frankly, the United States has no allies. 
the United States is just interested in their own interests and they are just interested in vessels. And that's the point. Poland and, and so on, all the, uh, all the other uh, uh, countries who were pushing Germany and Chancellor Scholz to say yes to the Leopard 2 tanks, they are also doing exactly that what the United States want from them. That's the thing. The United States pushing them into the front and saying to them, please do this, and then they're putting the pressure and um, creating an atmosphere of pressure to the German uh, government. Because of the German history, two times the two world wars started from Germany with the attacks against Russia or respectively Soviet Union. And now we are sending again tanks against Russia, against Moscow. And uh, our new foreign minister, I mean, she actually says that uh, Pistorius is wrong because she actually said last night, we are in a war against Russia. She said that literally. So that means uh, I, am, I am very uh, concerned that this is not the last decision taken by because the sending the uh, Leopard 2 tanks, they are not a game changer in the long term or in the medium term they will not change anything on the on the ground in ukraine because russia will react and uh, the problem is now the nationalist government in ukraine already demanded from germany and from the nato states uh, really massive uh, combat aircraft systems helicopters tornadoes Eurofighter, and that makes sense. It's understandable from the point of the Ukraine government to put NATO more and more into this war to help them to survive. But uh, I do think uh, that uh, that it's uh, it's not a military game changer sending the tanks, but it will be a political game changer. Uh, to put NATO states like Germany more and more into this war well, against uh, Russia. But we do need more diplomacy to end these killings, these senseless killings. Uh, whoever wants to send more weapons to Ukraine is in favor of more killings in Ukraine. Seven Dagelenwere, thank you very much for being with us. A member of the opposition left party in Germany, Kurdish German member of parliament, also a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Speaking to us from Havana, Cuba, where she is there as part of a delegation of Progressive International. Next up, the doomsday clock is moved closer to midnight than ever before. Back in 30 seconds. This is them by LCD Sound System. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists is warning the world is closer to global annihilation than ever before, in part due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Since 1947, the Bulletin has maintained a doomsday clock to illustrate how close humanity is to the end of the world due to existential threats, including nuclear war and the climate emergency. On Tuesday, the Bulletin reset the doomsday clock for 2023. The members of the Science and Security Board move the hands of the doomsday clock forward, largely, though not exclusively, because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. We move the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. After the doomsday clock was reset to just 90 seconds to midnight, Rachel Bronson of the Bolton Atomic Scientist spoke. Russia's thinly veiled threats to use nuclear weapons remind the world that escalation of the conflict by accident, intention or miscalculation is a terrible risk. 
the possibilities that the conflict could spin out of anyone's control remains high. We're joined now by Frida Berrigan, longtime peace activist and nuclear weapons abolitionist. Her new cover story for In These Times is headlined, How to Avoid Nuclear Standoffs That Threaten the Entire World. She's the daughter of, Free, of uh, Liz McAllister and Phil Berrigan and the niece of the late father Dan Berrigan. Frida Berrigan, thanks so much for being with us. Talk about the doomsday clock. Sure. The doomsday clock was developed uh, as, a, as a metaphor uh, by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists in the late 1940s. Um, it's moved uh, a, a number of times, maybe uh, 30, 40 times uh, in the last uh, 70 years. Um, this, as you have said, is the closest it's ever been to nuclear midnight, just a minute and a half, 90 seconds. Um, and what's striking about this is that, you know, we think about other hot moments uh, in the nuclear age, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. Uh, the clock stood at seven minutes uh, to nuclear midnight at that hot point when, uh, you know, people here in this country, people around the world really believe that a nuclear conflagration was imminent. And so I think comparing it to the Cuban Missile Crisis is a good metric for understanding just how dangerous this moment is with the confluence, uh, not only of the war in Ukraine, uh, but uh, the pro proliferation of nuclear weapons throughout the world um, and the climate crisis all coming together. And the, the doomsday clock kind of uh, takes those three, um, takes its measures from those three uh, intertwined crises. Um, so I, I'm glad this is getting uh, more attention uh, the doomsday clock is not always front-page news, although it ought to be. Um, uh, but this 90 seconds is, is a very dramatic uh, wake-up call uh, to the world that I hope uh, many, many people are hearing loud and clear. The clock is ticking, um, and uh, nuclear disarmament, nuclear abolition must be in the forefront of everyone's minds in this moment. And uh, Frida Bergen, I wanted to ask you about uh, what seems to me the uh, the p perennial uh, arrogance of our political and military leaders to feel that you can wage uh, these kinds of wars and control uh, the uh, the possibility of them ending up with nuclear war and this sense that w that war once unleashed can be controlled. Right, Juan. I, I think that, that that word is arrogance, right? And you said it. Um, I think the United States has, because of uh, the way in which we've invested in nuclear weapons, uh, the hubris of, of using nuclear weapons, not once but twice in 1945 against uh, the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, nuclear weapons have insulated the United States ever since uh, from the consequences of uh, of hegemony, right, and, and, and the imperial project of the United States. Um, and we continue, you know, uh, today to pump uh, tens of billions of dollars annually just into nuclear weapons. We're always, uh, the United States military uh, and weapons contractors are always uh, seeking to refine and uh, further uh, perfect uh, the ability to end the world as we know it. Um, and I think the the, the the height of arrogance in this moment is, is the notion of tactical small nuclear weapons, that we can control uh, the, the blast, we can control the dissemination of radiation, and that there are usable nuclear weapons uh, that we can, the United States can use in, uh, in wartime um, and, and not feel the consequences of them back here in the United States. And, uh, and this is... a this is a, a, a lie. This is a fabrication. Uh, this is a fantasy um, uh, that is uh, that is uh, perpetrated uh, by war planners here in the United States, um, and it's very, very dangerous logic um, that uh, that carries on. Um, and so, uh, I think at the end of the, the Cold War, the United States had a choice. It had a choice to either disarm uh, completely, abolish nuclear weapons, and there was. Uh, global momentum behind uh, that, uh, the, the world calling out uh, for global abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, and instead, uh, U.S. military planners uh, and the weapons industry, this 
multi-billion dollar industry that's so entrenched in American politics um, decided uh, to uh, to continue uh, to make nuclear weapons relevant, that this vast apparatus um, of, uh, of weapons contractors um, and uh, uh, laboratories at Sandia, Lawrence, Livermore, Los Alamos, that this would all stay and, uh, and we would continue to invest uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, in nuclear weapons going forward. And I think this stands um, in, uh, in opposition uh, to this growing global consensus that we see in the treaty on the abolition, uh, the treaty for um, uh, uh, the treaty uh, to prohibit nuclear weapons uh, that is gaining traction, uh, more and more countries signing on every year. Um, and, uh, and there's a reckoning uh, coming with the United States and the other nuclear weapons states as they stand against this global consensus uh, for nuclear abolition. Frida Berrigan, we thank you so much for being with us. Longtime peace activist, nuclear weapons abolitionist. Her new cover story for In These Times is headlined How to Avoid Nuclear Standoffs That Threaten the Entire World. And she's author of It Runs in the Family on Being Raised by Radicals and Growing into Rebellious Motherhood. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the state of Florida has blocked a Black Studies AP course from being taught. We will speak with the first openly gay state senator in Florida. Stay with us. Dana Zemtsov and Anna Fedorova. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez, as we look now at how racial justice advocates and educators in Florida are vowing to fight the rejection by Florida state education officials of a new advanced placement course for high school students in African American studies. Florida's Education Department said the course lacks educational value, reportedly raised concern about six points in the curriculum. Black queer studies, intersectionality, movement for black lives, black feminist literary thought, the reparations movement, and black struggle in the 21st century. On Monday, the Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, and possible presidential aspirant, said he supports the Florida Education Department's rejection of the course and claimed it violates state law. This course on black history, what are one of, what's one of the lessons about? Queer theory. Now, who would say that an important part of black history is queer theory? That is somebody pushing an agenda on our kids. And so when you look to see they have stuff about intersectionality, abolishing prisons, that's a political agenda. Later today, civil rights lawyer Ben Crump will announce a lawsuit against Florida over its rejection of an advanced placement African American studies pilot program that we're talking about today. He'll be joined by three AP honor students who will serve as the lead plaintiffs and by one of our guests who joins us now from Florida, in Tallahassee, the capital of Florida. Chevron Jones is Democratic Florida state senator, Bahamian-American and Florida's first openly gay state senator. And in Miami, we're joined by Dr. Steve Gallen, president of the Miami Alliance of Black Schools Educators and an elected school board member for Miami-Dade County Schools, a lifelong educator and former school teacher, principal and superintendent. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! State Senator Chevron Jones 
Jones, your response to the state blocking this national AP Black Studies course. Uh, well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I think it's important for us to point out uh, that this is far greater than just talking about AP classes right now. What we're talking about is the history of black America. We're talking about the plight of black America. And we also should make, make, sure, make sure that we point out that when we look at what Governor DeSantis and the Republicans are doing, this is just not a Florida thing. This is something that we need to ensure that does not happen and spread across this country. As I have made it clear, and I will continue to say it, that our history does bring educa educational value. We are of value. We are of, uh, of substance to this, to this country and of this state. And what the governor is doing in moving forward and blocking students from being able to not just learn about history, to understand other people's history. It is not only wrong, it's disingenuous to the 22 million people within this state and the 20 percent of African Americans who live amongst the 22 million people within the state of Florida. And, Senator, it's uh, obviously not just the governor. The Education Commissioner, Manny Diaz, Jr., called, quote, woke indoctrination masquerading as education. Uh, could you talk about the uh, why you feel this uh, movement from the most extreme elements of the Republican leadership in Florida is occurring now? I think it's important to understand that these buzzwords of indoctrination, wokeism, all of these things that uh, the governor and the Republicans, not just here in Florida, but across the country, uh, are saying actually have meaning. Uh, the word woke was used in the 1930s that was used by activists, uh, by leaders, to inform black Americans uh, to be cognizant of policies that were coming down um, from elected officials. And now that's being turned, uh, and now they are trying to indoctrinate children to say that that's wrong. Since when have we come to a place to where uh, we are banning books and telling children uh, what's appropriate, what they can and they cannot learn? That's not wokeism. That's not indoctrination. That's facts. Uh, that's how I've learned. That's how you learn. Uh, that's how the American people have learned over the years. We've learned about Jewish history. We've learned about European history. Now, all of a sudden, African-American history uh, is the problem? No. It's about what is happening across this country and what's being spread across this country for a time that we have fought so hard, my ancestors have fought so hard for to get us to this point, to get us out of the, uh, the place where we were, uh, our, the, where we were, to where we are now. Can you respond specifically, uh, State Senator Chevron Jones, to uh, DeSantis questioning what does Black queer history have to do with AP Black Studies? And in your response, if you can talk about, oh, everyone. Um, um, from Bayard Rustin uh, to James Baldwin, and what this means to you as the first openly gay state senator elected in Florida. The list can continue to go on. We can say James Baldwin. We can talk about Marsha P. Johnson. Let's continue. To, let's continue to call those names. That's America's story. That's who we are. I'm America's story, and somebody else will come and be America's story. Why are we taking that away from children? And, 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 and here's what we cannot allow the governor's office or anyone to get past, and that is the fact that they said what they said. They said that African-American studies brought no educational value to children in our education system. That means that we have the potential for black children in the state of Florida to learn and not be represented in their education. And as a black man, as the first openly gay black man here within the state of Florida, I know what my history is. But there's a young man, there's a young woman sitting in a classroom who needs to know a Marsha P. Johnson, who needs to know a James Baldwin, who must understand that their story has been told before, they made it, they can make it, and others will continue to make it as we continue to live in this place we call America. I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Steve Gallon to the conversation. Uh, could you, your reaction uh, to the um, uh, to the decision uh, uh, and, the, and the support of the governor for uh, against uh, this AP course, and also what's been the reaction on the Miami-Dade school board that you serve? Yes. Um, good morning again. Thank you for having me. Uh, my initial reaction was that the position that was messaged was counter to Florida law. 
Florida law explicitly stipulates that black history shall be taught to students throughout the state. It doesn't say may. It doesn't say can. It says shall. So to the extent that there was a denial of access to this information to a segment of students that may be interested and desirous of pursuing advanced placement courses, which obviously has a significant economic impact to them in their trajectory for higher education, I was somewhat taken aback. I, too, shared the sentiment relative to the message that came out, significantly lacks educational value. Uh, I think that resurrected a great sense of rancor amongst not only African Americans, but people uh, throughout the state and, quite frankly, as you could see, throughout the country. And as I've represented, although we represent approximately 22 percent of the population of the state of Florida, uh, African American history is not something that's simply contiguous to black students. African American history should be contiguous and accessible to all students, because I contend that knowledge is the bridge to understanding. So if we're going to deny that bridge, deny students an opportunity to cross that bridge to better understand their fellow students, their fellow neighbors, their citizens, I think that is taking us back. And again, I think the rancor around this particular issue has opened up significant wounds that have lingered, quite frankly, for over 400 years. And can you talk, uh, Dr. Steve Gallen, as a former superintendent, a former principal, a former teacher, they're talking about actual felony charges against teachers who speak about various issues. Explain what teachers are facing right now. I, I, I can't, Amy, imagine what it is like, having been a classroom teacher, as well as uh, Senator Jones has been. Uh, classrooms and, quite frankly, public education, I believe, still represents the final frontier for social justice. It represents the epicenter of freedom. And to the extent that teachers are feeling unsafe, they're not feeling comfortable, they're looking over their shoulder, uh, they're walking a fine line between instruction and being able to allow students to express themselves, uh, there's been a great degree of consternation around that particular issue. I've heard from teachers directly uh, regarding the fact that the academic freedom principles upon which instruction, pedagogy and public education have been grounded are being severely compromised. And again, students need to have an opportunity to express themselves, and education can be used as an instrument of freedom or an instrument of conformity. So what we're seeing in some cases is that either you conform or else. And conformity is not something that we want to uh, present to our students, not only in their learning, but in their lives, in what we call a democracy on the greatest country that the world has ever known. And, Dr. Gallen, uh, can this decision of the Education uh, Department be challenged? Uh, uh, we're, we're hearing now of a potential lawsuit about to be announced. Uh, are there any other ways to, to, to challenge this decision? What, 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 I, what I initially anticipated, and again, it's about messaging, uh, having been a part of bureaucracy for, again, over 30 years, uh, the process of submission, review, and feedback, that is a normal process, for one to submit something, to have it reviewed, to have feedback provided, and to have an opportunity to remediate any deficiencies or any gaps that may be perceived by the individual organization that received it, that's normal. I think what came out was the messaging, and that, again, uh, appeared to be somewhat uh, offensive. Not appeared to be. I take that back. It was actually offensive, the language that was used, when you're talking about something significantly lacks educational value. What portion of it? So that level of ambiguity, along with that messaging, uh, created the consternation, the rancor, and, quite frankly, the harm that many people feel regarding something that uh, we're very, very deeply concerned about. So we did anticipate, hopefully, that there would be an opportunity. I see that starting to take place right now. But it's not about intent. It's about impact. The impact has already been felt. Uh, by, by teachers, by uh, educators, by community members, by our, our leaders. And again, this is not something that's restricted to the African-American community. This is something that each and every one of us should all be concerned about, because we are, at the end of the day, we're all Americans, and we should be willing, ready, and able to uh, embrace, share, and appreciate, and most importantly, respect each other's story. I wanted to play more of Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. This is when he took his culture war on the road a few months ago to stump for Trump-backed candidates and the growing speculation about him running for president in 2024. 
We must fight the woke in our schools. We must fight the woke in our businesses. We must fight the woke in government agencies. We can never, ever surrender to woke ideology. And I'll tell you this, the state of Florida is where woke goes to die. Where woke goes to die. And I wanted to talk about people dying, Florida State Senator Chevron Jones. Um, a report from the Trevor Project last year found that LGBT youth who learned about LGBT issues or figures in school are substantially less likely to report a past year suicide attempt than those who did not. Talk about the fear of LGBTQ students right now, their safety. Yeah, one in four uh, LGBTQ youth uh, uh, commit suicide, uh, Amy, and it's not because of their, uh, because of who they are, it's because of how they are treated. Uh, just last year, we did the Parental Rights and Education Bill, uh, which was an attack on the LGBTQ community, and it, it reigned across this country. LGBTQ youth was far within this, uh, within the, uh, with, within the Capitol, uh, talking to legislators. Uh, it brings great harm. Uh, when individuals feel as if they cannot or they're not, represented, uh, again, here within their state, uh, individuals, they, they feel left out. Individuals feel as if they're going to lash out. Uh, and so it's dangerous, uh, what we're seeing. I think uh, uh, school board member Gallen, uh, he, he said it best, uh, it is the intersectionality of who we are uh, that makes us who we are. Uh, but what we are seeing here within the state of Florida is depending against marginalized community, depending against LGBTQ people, depending against African Americans. Uh, and yes, you just heard from the governor. You know, this is what woke comes to die, or this is the free state of Florida. But clearly, there's nothing free about what we're experiencing here within the state of Florida. Marginalized people are in bondage. Every single year, legislative session, it gets greater and greater because this is the agenda that's being pushed. And Senator Jones, so this agenda is being pushed not only in Florida, although it's become the uh, the poster state for it, but it's happening across the country. There's a wave of, of states attempting to censor discussions of race, uh, sexual orientation, and gender identity in public schools. Why do you think that is? Well, I can't speak to individuals' impetus behind why they're doing uh, what they're doing, um, but what I can what I can say uh, is that there there is a this outcry that's happening. I, I will piggyback off of school board member Gallon again uh, that this is more than just a black issue. This is more than just an LGBTQ issue. Uh, this is an issue that we as Americans should be fighting uh, together uh, to speak to why uh, this is this is happening. It's a power issue. When individuals see the shifting of America. The shifting of America causes for individuals to rise up and say, this, this was not be allowed. We want to make sure we do everything to keep the, our, our, finger, our finger on a pulse to make sure that we can control what you learn, we can control what you teach, we can control what you say, and we can control what you do. To be holding a news conference today with Ben Crump. Can you talk about the lawsuit that's being filed and how you want to deal with this as we move into Black History Month? Absolutely, Amy. Uh, the, we, we were just planning on having a, a plain press conference, uh, but this press conference has calls for students, high school students, college students from FAMU and from Florida State University to join in. We have uh, um, uh, Rebecca Pringle, the president from the National Education Association, who's coming down. The NAACP will be present. Uh, this is a national outcry, because I will say what you all just said, that this is bigger than just a Florida issue. This is a national issue. If you think that people across the country are not watching what happens in Florida because they believe if we can do it here, they can do it there. And that would be a problem. And that's why you see in the national outcry. The press conference that we're having today is to make it clear that we're if you're going to start here, we're going to match your energy. We're going to start here also, and we're going to file a lawsuit to make it clear that we, black people, marginalized people, will not be the political punching bag. Florida State Senator Chevron Jones, first openly gay state senator in Florida, and Dr. Steve Gallen, Miami-Dade County Schools Board member and lifelong educator. He's been a superintendent, uh, as well as a principal and teacher. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.